um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm delighted that EasyBib invited me. So I am an anthropologist, and I was hired by the university librarian at the University of North Carolina here in Charlotte to do and facilitate and think about qualitative research that can help inform library policy. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is not ethnography or it's not anthropology in the big sense that I'm, I'm not doing all of anthropology, but I'm using my expertise as an anthropologist to inform uh, approaches to thinking about and investigating our spaces. And so I'm just going to talk about a couple of pieces of the toolkit, and then you should feel free to ask me questions about any aspect of anything that I talk about today. Um, so I have shared the screen, and I'm sharing this Prezi with you, and I'm hoping um, that it will let me actually do the presentation. So uh, those of you who know about qualitative methods have probably seen this before, and it's just this nice little sort of continuum uh, talking about quantitative and qualitative methods. And I've highlighted with blue arrows four of the things that I've been using here in the library to investigate, especially user behavior and the kinds of things that our faculty and students are trying to do in the course of their academic work that we need to know about in the library so that we can think about services and so that we can think about resources and spaces and all those sorts of things. So I've highlighted videotaping and photography, passive observation, participant observation, and structured and semi-structured interviews. And those are some of the major approaches that I'm using to find out what's going on with people. Qualitative approaches are particularly good for getting at the why and the how of the things that people are doing. Quantitative approaches are particularly good, as all of you know, for the things that are measurable and countable. And so we're trying to get a sense of the logic behind the behaviors and the insights that we can gather from those sorts of things. So one of the instruments that I use to try to get a holistic ethnographic sense of what's going on with our patrons in the library is the photo diary instrument. And this is an instrument that I lifted directly from Nancy Foster's work at the University of Rochester with their studying students um, project. And it's basically a way for me to try to get a sense of the everyday lives of students without following them around all the time. I am something of a 9 to 5 anthropologist. I'm not here in the library at midnight. I'm not going to go back to their dorms. So asking them to do this sort of exercise in autoethnography um, in, in telling me through photos what they do is a way to sort of uh, compensate for, for my lack of being embedded in their community. And so this is the instrument that I use. And as I said, it's lifted almost entirely from the Rochester Project. There are a lot of these different uh, kinds of item lists floating around. They're relatively easy to find. And it's just a list of, of prompts. And then the idea is that the students use their phone or their camera. Uh, most of them have a phone anymore that's capable of taking pictures. And they just take each of these pictures, and then they hand them to me. And what I've done the last several years is I've partnered with an anthropology methods class. And their students in that class have done photo diaries for me. So I have photo diaries from three or four different semesters worth of anthropology classes. And I think each class gave me between 10 and 15 diaries. So I've actually got quite a lot of photos and data from the diaries. And in addition to the pictures they take, they tend to annotate the photos. And so what I'm showing you are selections from these photo diaries. And the first cluster of photos is the response that I get when I ask students what the most helpful thing in the library is. And what I'd like to point out is the diversity of things that they find helpful. They find people at the information desk helpful. They find the website helpful. They find the fact that we allow them uh, to have food and drink and that there's an attached cafe helpful. The self-service is helpful. Some of them only come in to use the printer, which is pictured on the lower right-hand side. And some of them even like the stacks. And so I think the diversity of things indicates that we can't simply say students need X and leave it at that. They need the people, they need the digital tools, 
Um, they need the whole range of things. And so photo arrays like this urge us not to narrow down and only offer one kind of thing. Part of the strength of our library is that we have these diversity of ways that students and faculty can interact with us, and they clearly value that diversity. These are the kinds of photos that we get when we ask them for pictures of computers in their usual places. And uh, the first time I did this photo diary exercise, I got actual desktop computer pictures. The last time I did it, I got almost entirely laptops. One of the things I find interesting is that the laptops in their usual places are not being photographed in library spaces. They're being photographed at home. So they are laptop computers, but in practice, they work an awful lot like desktops. They don't get taken to campus consistently. they are concerns about them being stolen. they are concerns about battery life. they are concerns about carrying too much heavy stuff around campus. So one of the things is that we can't assume that just because they have laptops that they're bringing them to us. And that has implications for how we think about on-campus computing, how we think about computers in the library, and that sort of thing. This is a picture, uh, an array of pictures that we got when we asked them about the place that they use the most in the library. And again, I want to highlight the diversity. We have uh, the picture in the lower right-hand corner that is on one of our tower floors, and it's this very traditional monastic carol space that a student went to to have isolated study time. Um, the other pictures are pictures of wide open spaces where there's lots of movement and activity and noise. The picture on the lower left, I want you all to remember, that's a picture of our new space. And this student did this photo diary within a week or so of the opening of that space. And she had already decided that that was the place she was going to use the most in the library. So again, there are students who want the wide open spaces, there are students who want the active spaces, and there are students who want the quiet, isolated spaces. And if we were to simply decide that only one of those sorts of spaces is appropriate for us in the library, we would be failing to serve several different segments of our population. The printer in the middle is, is also indicative of sometimes they just come into print, and that's all they do. And that's representative of a particular kind of library user as well. These photos are representative of what we get uh, for the prompt that says, the place that you feel lost in the library. We get so many pictures of stacks <laughs> for this particular prompt. And, uh, I think it is indicative of a problem that a lot of librarians know about is that the stacks tend to be incomprehensible to those who don't already know how to navigate them. Uh, the other place that they feel lost are hallways. Uh, wayfinding in institutional buildings is a big deal. It's a challenge. Um, I think that these sorts of photos prompt us to think about how can we build tools and how can we build digital tools in particular that can help people make our resources and our spaces more comprehensible. I think these sorts of photos point to problems that are solvable, but first of all, we have to know that they're a problem in the first place. This is what we get when we ask the students how they organize their time. When I first started doing the photo diaries in 2010, we got a lot of paper like the two uh, on the lower part of the screen. Now that smartphones are not just available but are cheap and relatively ubiquitous, we get a lot of captured screen caps of, of apps that they use to keep track of, of what they're doing and how they're doing. And so this is just a, a really nice example of the shifts that happen with the availability of tools and in particular with the affordable availability of tools. I will note, though, that we, stu we still get photos of stuff on paper. And paper is going to come up uh, later on as well. So that's photo diaries. Another method that I use to um, try to get a sense of what's going on is what I'm calling immersive observation. So in anthropological methods, we talk a lot about participant observation, which is the classic anthropologist goes to a small community lives in that community, participates in the life of the community, and then because they have an outsider's eye, they can be analytical and questioning about what's going on uh, in that community, in the life of the community. I'm not a student. 
I'm not easily uh, mistaken for a student these days. So I can't just go in and be a student, but I can inhabit the spaces and I can observe what's going on. I can occasionally take pictures of the kind of work that students are doing and then interview them about it and learn from it. The other thing I can do to finesse the fact that I'm not a student anymore is I hire students. And so I have graduate student and undergraduate, either um, actual paid graduate student researchers or occasionally undergraduate interns who help me observe um, and analyze the spaces that we're looking at. One of the other things I get to do in my job is think about comparative approaches to the research. And so as well as doing the work that I'm doing at UNC Charlotte, I've had the opportunity to go to University College London and look at the learning spaces that they have in their system of libraries. So some of the photos that I'm going to be showing you are actually London photos. And what I think is interesting is how similar they are. The three photos uh, on the, the two on the right and the one on the lower left are from UNC Charlotte. Uh, the one of the students looking at the screen against the maroon wall is from University College London. And these are really nice examples of what it looks like when students are working together on a project. And I think the thing that I'm struck by the most is the need for screens and surfaces. And by surfaces, I mean sitting surfaces, spreading out surfaces, and riding surfaces. They need ways to be able to capture the thinking work that they're doing on whiteboards or on pieces of paper. They also need to be able to refer to the digital materials, tools, uh, things that they're working with in their courses. And so the presence of screens in conjunction with whiteboard spaces, in conjunction with places where they can spread out all of the different things that they need to work with, those are the component parts of successful collaborative working spaces. And when I first started working at UNC Charlotte, in 2009, one of the things that I observed was students trying unsuccessfully to do collaborative work in spaces that weren't quite right for that yet. So this documentation that I've done of them successfully and happily working together in the spaces that we configured is a, is a nice way of illustrating sort of what we aspire to and the kinds of spaces that students flock to. This cluster of pictures is again, a mix of folks from UNC Charlotte and University College London. And there are a few things that I want to point out here. First of all, they still need a lot of space. And so tables that only give you a slice that doesn't allow for the presence of all the different stuff they need to spread out are not going to be as effective as the really relatively traditional big tables, the tables that we've had in libraries for hundreds of years. Those are still really effective pieces of furniture for the kinds of things that our students need to do, especially with the ubiquity of wireless devices these days. They can come in with their laptop. They can come in with their paper notebooks. They can come in with their tablets. They can come in with their drinks. <laughs> uh, our library has been allowing food and drinks since before I got here. Um, and I'm here to tell you that uh, we haven't had a disaster yet. Uh, and it's clear that at University College London, they also um, get to drink along with the, the work they do. And part of this is that our students come in and they work for hours. And so if we were to force them to leave the library to get a drink, to have a snack, uh, to replenish themselves, they would lose their focus. They would lose their space. It just wouldn't be as effective an environment for them to do their work. Um, I think the conjunction of, again, analog materials like paper and pens with the digital tools that they need, they're using it all together. So these, these dreams of the purely digital experience uh, in academia are still far, far away. Um, things like batteries, things like budgets, uh, things like compatibility or incompatibility of tools, um, all of these things make paper occasionally the best option for our students. And so again, thinking about the diversity of ways that the students and faculty need to do their work is an important part of thinking about the planning. Um, and I'll just tell you that the two London photos are in the upper left and then in the middle right. And then uh, our new UNC Charlotte collaborative space is on the lower left with the student with the Chick-fil-A bag and the big screens. 
So again, a diversity of places, but uh, very, very similar looking workspaces. So this diagram came out of work that an architecture master's student who uh, did some work for me did a couple of semesters ago. And I want to use it as an example of the kinds of ways that we can collaborate with scholars on campus, including graduate students, who have very different skill sets than we do. I am not a drafts person. I am not somebody who thinks about space in the same way that an architecture student would. And so it's a tremendous advantage to me to be able to work with these students and their faculty to find ways to learn more about the spaces and the things that are happening in the spaces here at UNC Charlotte. And this is the work of Mitch McGregor, and he has since gotten his master's degree. I have actually blogged a bit, and he uh, guest blogged uh, as well on the work that he did for his master's thesis. But this is a representation of uh, a moment in time where uh, students were doing uh, group work in conjunction with a screen that Mitch set up next to a whiteboard. So at the time, we hadn't yet put together our large new collaborative space. We were gathering information that would help us think about the kinds of things we wanted to put in the new space. So this is basically an experiment. Up until this point, we didn't have whiteboards and screens together in this space. And so Mitch just took this little piece of our spaces and popped a screen in there. And then he spent about 50 hours observing what people did over the course of a couple of weeks and then recorded it. And, and what he found was precisely the sort of thing that I was talking about with the group work, that the the presence of both screens and whiteboards in conjunction with soft surfaces and configurable furniture was not just really effective for facilitating group work, but very, very attractive. As soon as he put the screen in, this part of the floor was the busiest part of the floor. And when the experiment was over, students asked us where the screen had gone. So we knew we were on the right track when we then talked to uh, classroom support and when we talked to uh, the people who we needed to about what the new space was going to look like, about what students needed, not just in the reservable study rooms, but also just sort of out in space generally. I was lucky enough to get to work with an additional um, architecture student, Allison Schaefer, and she came on after we had opened our new collaborative spaces. And so what I've got on the screen now is Allison's mapping of circulation patterns through the space. And there was also a sense of how many people were in that space at the same time. And this is important because we get to document how it is people are moving through the space. And there was some confirmation of things that we thought would be the case, the dark dotted lines between the entryway and the stairwell, for instance. The additional dark, lotted, dark dotted line between the coffee shop and the stairwell. Those are things to be expected. But the, the interesting wandering lines of students sort of walking around and figuring out where they were going to go, the absence of wandering lines on the right-hand side where there's this nice curved window was something that was unexpected to us and allowed us to think about how have we configured that space and is it effective? And do we want it to continue to be that way? Another thing that Allison did was behavior mapping. And she plotted several different kinds of behavior on the map. And then we overlapped them to see where they coexisted. And so I just picked a couple to, to show you here. Um, this one is where people study and where people talk. The studying is in green, and the talking is in purple. And I find this very useful to talk about in a library context because the overlap of studying and talking is striking in particular areas. You see it in the rooms that are the reservable study rooms, but you also see it out in the open areas. So the idea that we would have purpose-built a uh, place in the library where constructive yet noisy work can happen, um, we're certainly not the first people to do it, but I think we're documenting that uh, academic work is not always quiet, and we need uh, special built spaces 
for that sort of work to happen because it's legitimate, because it's important, and because it should be supported. I like this map a lot. Um, this is also, again, you see studying in green. Laptop use is in orange. And one of the things I think this map shows you is that just because somebody is on a laptop doesn't mean they're studying. <laughs> so again, these things that we think that are signifiers for a particular kind of academic work um, can occasionally break down if we look at them a little bit more carefully and if we look at them a little bit more critically. I think that one of the things that the ethnography project at Atkins has allowed us to do is to challenge and deconstruct a bit the traditional ideas of what academic work looks like. Sometimes it happens uh, sitting on a couch with your feet up on a coffee table. Sometimes it happens in a cafe. Sometimes it happens at a desk on a hard chair. Um, but there are multiple different environments in which people are constructive. And people certainly experience this in their everyday lives. But I think it's something that needs to be communicated at an institutional level so that we can have a much better fit between the kinds of environments that people are actively seeking out and the kinds of environments that we're providing. Um, I see a question about how we got the behavior maps. What Allison did was she did observations at two different times of the semester. She did the, her first set of observations over two days at the beginning of the semester for four hours each day. And she just had a floor map, and she just plotted, color-coded, and then she went into um, uh, just Adobe and, and made the maps. Um, she did that for two days in the beginning of the semester, and then she did a follow-up for two days in the previous semester. These maps I'm showing you are from the first iteration of observations. But what's striking um, is that her second iteration of observations gave us very, very similar looking maps. The distribution of the kinds of different things that people were doing in this space hadn't shifted that much over the semester. Um, and this was a brand new space in January of 2013. So there weren't any preconceived notions about where people had gone in the past um, as opposed to where they were going now. But what we did in terms of setting up furniture that signaled particular kinds of work uh, seems to have been relatively successful and seems to have set the tone for the kinds of things that students are doing in this space. So I'll just talk briefly about outcomes and then you can ask me all sorts of questions. Um, so the new ground floor collaborative space is the sort of most recently important outcome of the kind of work that I, that I get to do here at UNC Charlotte. And these are some pictures of the, the space as it's um, uninhabited. It's currently full of students. I'm sorry, I can't show you what's going on. But this open, configurable uh, combination of whiteboards with screens, with uh, furniture that's comfortable for the student, this was instantly uh, one of the most popular places in the library as soon as it opened. And its proximity to the cafe is part of it, but I think it's also the fact that students could come in and program this space the way they need it to be. And it is uh, not just got the furniture that they need, but also has the technology that they need uh, to be able to do their academic work. So in thinking about the importance of digital spaces, because the photo diaries um, among other things, indicate that some students' primary interaction with the library is in our digital space. We have uh, large chunks, especially of our graduate population, who don't set foot in the library. They do almost all of their work online through the library website. And so thinking about our digital spaces is tremendously important. And so we have engaged in uh, development uh, from the library of things like a uh, mobile site for phones and for tablets and also in just web development generally uh, to pay attention to the fact that for some people the library website is a library. The other possibility in terms of digital spaces is that if people come to our digital spaces and can't do what they need to do, they're far less likely to come into our physical spaces. So thinking of digital spaces as a, a portal uh, through which the, the library can perform a particular kind of credibility, I think is really important and is something that institutionally we, we're paying a lot of attention to. 
The third is thinking about tools that we can uh, develop for future needs and for needs that we're identifying now. So you'll remember I talked about how students are feeling sort of lost in particular parts of the library, particular parts of the collection. Um, we have, uh, again, in our digital initiatives department within the library, built uh, the first iteration of a digital wayfinder. And this is sort of the first version of it. But the idea here is that students can come into the building and with a digital tool be given a sense of where they need to go to do the stuff that they need to do before they start walking through those hallways and before they start trying to navigate the stacks that they haven't really had a whole lot of, of experience navigating before. So we're thinking about the kinds of things that students are used to being able to do now. They're used to being able to uh, use digital tools like Google Maps to go places that they've never gone before. So we're plugging into expectations that students are already walking into the building with. They're already walking into the building with the idea that they could use their phone, that they could use their tablet, that they could use something to help them navigate a physical space. And so this is an ongoing development project, but it's something that's really exciting because we could build all sorts of different things into it. If we can make our building navigable, we can make our collections navigable. We can make our services navigable. There are all sorts of different ways that we can connect people uh, by using digital tools in the context of our physical spaces. So we're, we're very excited about that. The last thing that I'd like to, um, the software that we use for the Wayfinder is um, code that was actually developed by a UNC Charlotte uh, engineering student and then was handed off to our team. And so they're working with a uh, very specific code. Um, that's something that I could hook people up with if they're interested in thinking about that. The last point I would like to make in this sort of official part of the presentation is that you can't just do the research and then stop. Anthropologists talk about uh, this thing called the ethnographic present, where you go in and you write your book about the people, and then you publish the book, and then if you never go back, those people get frozen in time, and you don't get a sense of, of what's happening now. And so traditionally, anthropologists go back after a while, and they write an addendum to the chapter, and they say, well, it was like this when I was doing my field work, but now it's like that. So in my job, one of the things that I'm responsible for is not just in helping inform new spaces, but in looking at those spaces after we open them up and after we configure them and seeing if we were right. Uh, one of the risks of being evidence-based and one of the risks of valuing this kind of research is that uh, we are opening ourselves up to the possibility that we could be wrong. But what this research allows us to do is figure out ways to fix it if we did get it wrong in the first place. So uh, it's quite nice to think that I get to keep doing this because uh, there are new things that are going to come up that we simply don't know that we need to respond to. So the qualitative research that we're doing is one way of trying to sort of get ahead of the curve and try to see how we can respond, not in a crisis, but in a thoughtful way to things that we see coming because we're paying attention to it in the first place. And that's the end of the official part. So uh, we can open it up for questions. And thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, uh, Donna. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat box. Um, Donna, I have a question for you. Uh, for some of the uh, attendees here who might not have, be fortunate enough to have an anthropologist such as yourself uh, taking a look at what a, their students are doing, uh, what are some ways that they can do this on sort of a smaller scale um, with a smaller budget, particularly for those uh, librarians who may be dialing from high school libraries or something like that? So I think that looking at the publications that have come out uh, out of the Rochester project in particular, but also um, the Ariel project, uh, which was the Illinois uh, libraries project that uh, happened, uh, they're still publishing on their stuff a couple of years ago with Andrew Asher. There are resources both in, in print and online that have toolkits that talk about the kinds of instruments that you could use, that can talk about photo diaries, that can talk about how would you um, 
how would you go ahead and, and you know, do something like participant observation? How, how would you go ahead and, and conduct an interview? Um, some of these things are relatively time consuming, but they don't necessarily have to be terribly expensive. I think the observations in particular are something that if you pay attention, you can simply just do. And some of the challenge of, of having an ethnographic eye is just thinking about the ways that people enter the space and assuming that there's a logic to what people are doing. So, so instead of just taking for granted the things that are happening in your spaces, start thinking about why. Start thinking about why does it look the way it does. Um, and that often is enough to sort of set you down the road to, to doing particular things. Um, somebody just shared a link to the Aerial Project, which is great. Um, and then I don't have a link right now on me to the, the Rochester work, um, but it's uh, Nancy Freed Foster. F-O-S-T-E-R, and she's actually just moved over to Ithaca SNR, um, but her studying students' initiatives with uh, Susan Gibson, who I believe is now currently at Yale, um, is some of the foundational work in library ethnography in terms of thinking about library spaces uh, with social science tools. Okay, and uh, Donna, there was one question above that, too. I just wanted to make sure that you saw it. Um, where can I find out the ordering info for the white separating screens and the maroon one that you were showing? <laughs> so the maroon one is at London. And if I, uh, if I have a chance, they're all on holiday. Uh, so <laughs> if I have a chance, um, I can try to get the information on that. The white separating screens, um, we did order that. and. Um, I can try to get that information and, and hand it off. Um, if you want to email me, I can get you specific information on that. OK, great. One of the challenges and, uh, is a big, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to say, is a big institution. No, 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 go we ahead, Donna, go ahead. We, we don't always have control over um, all the different ways that we can order furniture and where we can order it from. So. Um, there's, a, there's another balance there between the sorts of things that we want to see happen and then uh, collaborating with the other parts of campus that do things like order furniture and things like that. Um, somebody's asking me about IRB permission. Uh, so yes, the entire ethnography project has a human subjects protocol on file. It was one of the first things that I had to do when I started my job is write up all the different ways that I was going to be attempting to investigate people. Um, and one of the things that's nice about the Human Subjects Board at my university is that we have quite a large collection of people who do qualitative research. And so they know that things like participant observation um, or informal interviews are the kinds of things that you wouldn't necessarily do a formal consent form for, but that you would want to be sort of reassuring about this is relatively low risk. I'm observing people in public spaces. I'm not asking them about things that they're doing in their private spaces. I'm asking them about things they're doing in the public sphere. So I had to lay out in a, in a great deal of detail what I was doing, why I was doing it, and why I don't think it's risky to the people among whom I'm doing it. Um, and uh, yeah, everybody should have to do that. Uh, I do uh, work in a collaboration with uh, Oxford University and OCLC looking at modes of engagement that uh, people adopt when using digital resources, academic and otherwise. And one of the populations that we were interviewing for that collaboration, the Visitors and Residents collaboration, are under 18s. And so we had to have very specific protocols in place for how we would recruit minors, how we would get consent, and all of that sort of thing. So yes, when you do research with human beings, you've got to think through the ethics of it. Oh, as for the obtrusive part, um, I will tell you what, it is really, really easy to sit in a library space with a laptop, taking notes on the behavior of the people around you, and to be utterly invisible. Uh, when people are doing their work, they're not looking at you. And they're not looking so much at the people who are observing uh, them. Uh, every once in a while, I'll walk up to a student and I'll ask them a question. And I'll identify myself. And for the most part, they are interested in the fact that I'm interested in what they're doing. So I haven't yet had a, a bad reaction. 
um, once I've let it be known that they were being watched. Um, and actually yesterday I wrote a blog post about how we mapped where students are sleeping uh, on the ground floor space and there were some students that were very amused by the fact that we were interested enough in where they slept to, to map that. So. Donna, one of the questions that I had was, uh, have you seen any, or have your librarians that you work with seen any difference in, say, circulation or things like gate count? I don't know if they track that, something like that at uh, your academic library. Uh, or visits to the reference desk. Has any of those metrics been affected since the redesign of the library? So the opening of the ground floor, and I, and I don't have numbers for gate count, uh, just on a how many people are in the building at any given point in time and how busy our spaces are, there was definitely a jump after we opened the ground floor. It's a much more inhabited space. There's m more space to be inhabited, um, but it's, it's just a busier, livelier library. In addition to the reconfiguring of spaces, I think one of the major changes that we did that had an impact was going from a schedule where we close at a particular part of the night to a 24-5 schedule during most of the semester and a 24-7 schedule during finals. That had a significant measurable impact on the number of people who were in the library at any given point in time. So it's, right. there's a combination of things that are happening, but it, it, it's definitely visible. Now, I don't know about circulation, and I would actually be surprised if our circ stats of physical things went up. Um, at the same time that we were configuring physical spaces, we were also increasing our subscriptions to uh, digital resources. And so I know that we are more used than ever, both in our digital spaces and our physical spaces, but there are several different factors that, that go into that. Right. Okay. So I see this question about the use of color, and I haven't done a lot of work on that yet, um, and I would be interested to know. The interviews that I've done with some students about the spaces they like, they do talk about color, and they do talk about um, spaces they're attracted to. We, we have some parts of the library uh, that are painted a very distinctive shade of blue, and some students call that out and they say they, they really like it. Um, the, the colors and the finishes in the remodeled spaces is not something that I personally had input in, um, but it's something, it is something that I'm interested in, something that I'd, I'd like to look at in the future. Uh, when we ask students open-ended questions about the kinds of things they want in the space, uh, beauty and color and movement are things that they like to contemplate having in the spaces that they're in a lot. And so spaces that have art, spaces that have thoughtful uses of natural light, um, those are the kinds of things that they go to when they're not in the library. And those are, those are definitely things that I would like to consider bringing more of into our spaces to respond to those needs. Okay, so uh, Donna, I think that might be all the questions we have for today. Uh, if anybody okay. does have any additional questions, um, you can, oh, no, we have one right here. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, questions about what students value most or has the most impact on their academic successes. You know, uh, there, are, there are surveys that um, are conducted by 
institutional research here on campus that asks students to self-report um, what has the most impact on their success. And we do have access to, to those reports. Um, some students call out the library. Um, a lot of them are uh, linking their notions of success to things that aren't directly library stuff, but are things like the relationship they have with faculty, uh, the connection that they have to the academic community on campus, um, the connections that they have to their peers, uh, their engagement with their subject matter. So I think that one of the ways that, that we're trying to hook into the sorts of things that lead to student success is by plugging into larger campus agendas about what we need to do for our students. So if one of the things that leads to success is engagement with faculty, then we in the library as fellow faculty members need to collaborate with our colleagues in the classrooms and in the departments to do and produce engaging scholarship that ultimately leads to uh, the kinds of things that we want students to do to be successful, not just at the university, but in you know wherever they go after the university. So from a larger policy perspective, our broader engagement in the uh, success of our community is the way that we can uh, participate in that. I think the library as a centralized sort of neutral ground for people to come together and do academic work is something that is, it's not unique to American universities, but I think it's distinctive. And certainly the work that I did um, at University College London, where they have a lot of branch libraries, made me think about the ways that um, a fragmented system like that means that they don't have this sort of neutral space where people can come together and work in cross-disciplinary ways or you know, just work in ways that aren't necessarily tied to the specifics of their location on campus. So uh, university libraries as places where people can come together and do scholarship is, is something that we're certainly invested in at UNC Charlotte, but I think it's a real advantage of the sort of large university library that, that we've got. Donna, in your studies, uh, did the way that faculty are using the library, did that come into play at all? Well, what we know about the way faculty are using our library is that they tend not to use library spaces very much. They tend to use library services an awful lot. And they, we deliver materials to faculty. Um, a lot of the materials that faculty are using, especially journal publications, is now electronic. So they're, they're getting that wherever they are. Um, but even when they're getting uh, print materials, we uh, have a delivery to faculty offices service, and they use that extensively. Um, one of the ways that we're trying to transform the faculty relationship to the library is what I talked about earlier, is the production of scholarship from and within the library itself. So having faculty and graduate student-centered um, digital scholarship labs and uh, thinking of ways that we can partner with faculty on campus uh, to help them do the work that they need to do and also sort of collaborate with us in the work that we want to do. Um, so that kind of relationship isn't necessarily one that is about our spaces, but it's, it's more about sort of the relationship that we have with them as colleagues. Uh, and what would be your advice for those listening in who may have uh, trouble with their administration seeing this as a priority? So priorities are, are challenging. And, and um, we're, we're lucky at UNC Charlotte in that we didn't have to do a lot of convincing uh, that qualitative research would be an effective way of informing policy because the leadership showed up invested in, in doing this kind of qualitative research. And one of the things I would say as somebody who has been trained to, to value qualitative inquiry is that there are some things that you simply can't count. 
but they're things that are important that we still need to know about. And so qualitative research doesn't have to replace quantitative, but, but it's a really important component to, to gaining insight into what those numbers that you collect means. Um, the other argument that I would suggest is, is one about, about budgets and effective use of resources. If uh, people have less and less money, it's worth it to try to figure out if the money that we're spending on the things that we're doing is worthwhile and effective. And I think that the kind of inquiry that we're engaged in at UNC Charlotte is a way of making effective arguments for putting resources in particular places. Um, and we're certainly not the only ones who are doing it. So, so people who want to start it up at their institution can point to projects like Rochester and here at UNC Charlotte, the Ariel um, project. Um, Andrew Asher is, is now at uh, Bloomington and uh, he is uh, in assessment there. And so there, there's potential for collaboration across institutions and, and support that we can give to smaller institutions or institutions that have never done this before to encourage them to do this kind of thing. Great, thank you for that. Uh, now, does anybody have any other questions that they'd like to ask Donna? Um, again, you could uh, shoot me an email and I'll put my email in the chat box right now. Um, or you can find Donna on Twitter. Um, I think that that might be it this time. Um, I know I had a false alarm last time. <laughs> Uh, but Donna, just thank you so, so much for your time. I know that I really enjoyed this um, and it made me think uh, a lot back on how I used to use the library as an undergraduate and a grad student. So it was really interesting to hear about this. Uh, so thanks again. Again, thank you to all of you who attended and we'll make sure to send around that recording, uh, the certificate of completion and uh, we'll actually include the chat list as well so you can see the questions and we'll include those links. Uh, that um, I think it was Susan uh, very kindly uh, sent around to us. So uh, thanks very much to everyone who attended and thank you Donna. We really appreciated this. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Okay, great. Uh, have a great afternoon everybody.